Hello, uh, my name is Shailen Bandare and I am the senior uh, assistant keeper of Oriental Numismatics at the Ashmolean Museum of uh, University of Oxford. I'm also uh, a member of faculty at the Oriental Studies and a fellow at St. Cross College. It gives me great pleasure to uh, bring this talk to you and uh, I've chosen the topic of uh, coinage in Gandhara because it is indeed a very fascinating uh, subject within the broader remits of Indian numismatics. We'll be seeing uh, through 10 highlights from the Ashmolean's collection and through which we will get uh, a kind of a journey sense through about 600 years of Gandharan history. So just as a matter of uh, locating ourselves, the area of Gandhara, as you can see in this map, is located to the kind of northwestern parts of the Indian subcontinent. and. Um, largely uh, sort of to the south of uh, the Hindu Kush mountains. Um, but also the, the, we have to remember the fact that this area became important not only because it is its, its kind of unique location, but also because of the fact that political developments further north in what is today Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan or Tajikistan and what was in ancient times known um, as the region of Bactria uh, played a very important role in political developments in, in this, this particular uh, corner of the Indian subcontinent. By and large, uh, Gandhara has a, a, a kind of an uninterrupted historical timeline that starts uh, in the proto-historic period, uh, wherein um, um, excavations have revealed the presence of what is called as the Gandhara grave culture, it was then followed around 600 BC when Gandhara became a satrapy or a province in uh, the Achaemenian Empire. Um, the Achaemenians in their own turn gave course to the Greeks and it was the most important event that Alexander the Great appeared in Gandhara in around 326 BC. And of course, everybody in India knows this famous story about the encounter between Alexander the Great and the Indian King Porus. Um, after the Greeks uh, receded, uh, then Alexander's empire was uh, split into um, large uh, areas which were sort of uh, ruled by his uh, generals, what people who were uh, kings who were originally his generals. The Gandharan uh, area became sort of split between Mauryans on one side and also the, the, the split of the, the, the split part of Alexander's empire that was in Bactria, which eventually uh, uh, led to a, a lineage of kings or group of kings, which were known as the Indo-Greeks. And by and large, their period has been roughly between um, uh, 250 to 90 BC. Um, the Greeks were then subsequently uh, superseded by Scythians or Shakas, as they're known in Indian history roughly between 2nd century and 1st century BC, then also by Parthians or Indo-Parthians, and then eventually by another strong uh, centralized empire, which was uh, of the Kushans, which sort of from the 1st to 4th century uh, AD. The Kushans were then sort of taken over by uh, what was a kind of a fraction or fragment uh, to, the, to the West, which was ruled by the Sasanians and uh, then gradually succumbed to the invasion of the Huns, uh, which came from Central Asia, uh, and the Huns of three kinds, Kidarites, Heptalites, and Alkhon Huns, um, which eventually then gave way to the Turk and Hindu Shahis. And in 10th century onwards, roughly, uh, we had the advent of Islam in this region. So this is a, a constant, more or less linear history of various periods in, in Gandhara. Um, the period that we are uh, particularly interested in is the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, and this is this is a, again a locator map uh, that shows the core uh, of the Indo-Greek uh, Kingdom, which was uh, the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, which was in Bactria, and this was formed by the secession of two satraps or two governors, uh, namely Diodotos the first and the second from the successor states of Alexander the Great, and that was the Seleucid uh, state. And this was this sort of this secession happened in about 250 BC. Quite interestingly, the Greco-Bactrian kings then subsequently, around 175 BC, um, during the, the reign of a king called Eucratidus, uh, crossed over the Hindu Kush and came over on the 
other side or the southern side of the Hindu Kush mountains into the region was proper Gandhara. And at that time, this, this region was sort of witnessing the, re, the, the recession uh, uh, of, uh, of Mauryan rule from this region. When they came into contact with uh, mainland India, as it were, uh, or Indian subcontinent, they came into in, in contact also with a very different uh, cultural uh, tradition, different scripts, different different religious systems, and this this kind of interaction, as we shall see through the coins, um, gave rise to uh, an, a unique kind of syncretism, which was fostered um, by the wealth that was accrued by the location of these this kingdom on to the south to, to the immediate south of of the of the famed uh, silk route so the location the trade and the political uh, nature of 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 the indo greek strait played a massive role in uh, in 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 their uh, flourish the next two maps uh, again kind of show us uh, um, kind of range of successor states roughly again this is this is not uh, by any means any kind of uh, uh, concrete representation but the indo scythians the kind of you know the core area of of their rule and also the kushans on on this side uh, on on the right which have this 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 massive empire that was built in uh, the early centuries of uh, the common era gandhara is also extremely well known for its very rich um, archaeological heritage and this is just a, a map that shows you how rich the archaeology in, in this part is and you can see from the, the number of black dots that uh, the archaeological sites in Gandhara are just too many it is kind of absolutely bursting with uh, archaeological flourish everywhere um, to know more about Gandhara we have uh, certain sets of evidences and uh, you have archaeology you have epigraphy and exemplified by this little reliquary casket which you see here on the um, on the right which has a karoshti inscription on it and recently found uh, epigraphical material such as the buddhist uh, karoshti scrolls which are now in the british library but by far the most important source for gandharan history and particularly uh, chronology is uh, the study of its uh, coins and the, therefore coins occupy a very very significant role in what we know about Gandhara in particularly in its skeletal kind of historical elements and before the coins were studied properly uh, we knew only two kings one one from a text a buddhist text called Melinda Panna the questions of King Melinda and um, that was King Menander and one more king that was known from an inscription in um, uh, which was left in Vidisha in central India and that was anti alkidas but after the coins were studied properly and you know um, catalogued properly now we know more than 28 kings so you can see that the, the entire historical picture has been completely changed um, with uh, numismatic uh, studies um, the Ashmolean uh, has one of the best collections of uh, Gandharan coins particularly of the Indo-Scythian, Indo-Parthian and Kushan periods. Together, uh, our holdings in the Gandharan uh, series are nearly 7,000 coins. And the major bulk of that, uh, the, those holdings comes from the collection of Robert Senior, who uh, published a path-breaking study in terms of uh, the chronological uh, use and deployment of these coins. And as you can imagine, the chronology is extremely significant because this this is the period also very significant in terms of art history. Uh, Gandharan art is, is a very famous and very important uh, cultural trope of, of research and therefore to actually pinpoint various artistic developments on this chronological framework uh, is very significant and that's where uh, coins have uh, played their uh, very crucial role. Moving over to uh, the 10 coins that I've selected and we are going to see as I said um, a complete spectrum from about 250 BC down to about 500 uh, AD um, and I've selected a few sort of salient examples from, from the collection. What I will be doing is uh, describing these coins to you and also some sort of highlighting some, some aspects of it which are in, in either in terms of typology or in terms of design or in terms of uh, uh, inscriptions or legions on them are uh, important for us to, to, uh, to, to know. 
So the first coin that we see here is um, a very Greek looking coin, as you can imagine. The obverse uh, has the depiction of a, a bust, uh, which is in profile of a king who is wearing a diadem, which is this um, a ribbon that he's wearing across his head, which was a symbol of, uh, of kingship in, in ancient Greek uh, cultural practice. And this is a coin of a ruler whose name appears on the reverse as Diodotos, and we don't know whether it is the Diodotos the first or Diodotos the second, uh, because it just doesn't, uh, and these, these two kings ruled in very close succession. But these were the first coins that were struck by the Bactrian kings in Bactria, which is uh, across the Hindu Kush mountains on the north, in the region of Trans-Oxiana, and they are they actually follow very much the Greek convention. They have the picture of the, of the, the bust of the ruler on one side, and the representation of a divinity on the other side. In this case, we see the naked figure of uh, Zeus, the, the greatest Greek god, who's shown throwing a thunderbolt with his right hand. And on his, on his left hand rests uh, a, 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 a skin which has the face of, 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 a, of a demon on it. And uh, the skin was called as Aegis. And below you also see the eagle and also the, the laurel wreath that signifies uh, Zeus's uh, supreme uh, di divine uh, status. And on either side of this uh, de depiction of Zeus, you have uh, a Greek inscription which re reads Basileos on the, the right hand side and Diodoto uh, on, on the left hand side. And it is in the genitive case, it means of King uh, Diodotos. Uh, and this is, this is probably the earliest of the Greco-Bactrian uh, coins. The Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek coinage in the sort of spectrum of this coinage, gold coins are quite rare. Uh, they were not struck uh, as as some as, as a kind of currency issues, mostly struck as store of value, and uh, not many of these gold coins are known. So they're, they're, this is this is a fairly rare uh, coin uh, to be. The second coin is a very interesting series that was issued under the um, Greco-Bactrian ruler Agathocles. And this is a series that uh, actually it sort of commemorates Agathocles' predecessor kings um, onto the, the obverse. I mean, unlike the previous coin that we saw, there is no picture of Agathocles himself on these coins. Uh, the inscription mentions him, but the depiction on, on, on the coin is actually of his predecessor. Um, and it is quite interesting that um, these kings actually trace back their ancestry to Alexander the Great. And it is not, obviously they were not related to Alexander the Great by blood as it were, they were, they were not uh, uh, descendants, uh, genetic descendants of Alexander the Great, but somehow in their historical memory, uh, it is significant to notice that Alexander occupied a unique position, and that's that's where uh, they sort of um, uh, trace the the the, back, the 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 genealogy of their their appearance in this kind of you know um, far flung region from Macedon, from where Alexander came. And this is a coin which actually shows Alexander's portrait um, on obverse. And uh, here you can see Alexander is depicted as Heracles, uh, the Greek god by its choice of wearing a strange kind of headgear which is uh, made up of a lion's skin and you everybody knows the story of uh, heracles and the nemean lion uh, uh, which which was a lie one of the tasks that um, um, heracles accomplished was killing of this nemean lion and this 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 lion was then skinned and heracles then sort of wore its skin as as his attire interestingly on this coin um, Alexander is uh, identified not only just as Alexander, but as son of Philip. So on either side uh, of this depiction uh, of the bust, you have the name Alexandru uh, on the right and To Philippou, uh, the son of Philip on the left. On the reverse, you see again a seated uh, Zeus, uh, you know, which is differing from uh, the previous depiction, which was a thundering Zeus. And here again, um, you have the name of Agathocles inscribed on, on the coin. What is also quite interesting is that this coin not only commemorates Alexander uh, by its name and its depiction, the imagery that it copies is also from Alexander's own coin. So it is a kind of numismatic 
testimony or the numismatic commemoration of Alexander. And this is a unique thing. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the Greek world. And there are sort of um, uh, indications that one might uh, uh, suggest that this was kind of prompted by the idea of ancestor worship. Uh, that was prevalent in the Indic uh, side of of the of the of the Greek uh kingdom, and here again you see that Zeus is sitting on the throne in profile and has is holding uh, the the figure of uh, the the eagle in his hand. Um, what you see just near the knees of the Zeus is a very interesting emblem, which is composed of uh, two or three Greek letters. And this is again a, a very interesting feature of many Indo-Greek coins that these kind of little symbols, which uh, numismatists often called monograms, uh, appear on these coins. And we, we still don't know exact uh, role or meaning of these symbols. It's absolutely certain that they had something to do with minting. It's something to do with uh, the functionality of the mint. But it is most likely not a mint mark. It does not actually denote a place where the, the coin was ma uh, minted. But this is a kind of feature that is worth noting when one studies uh, Indo-Greek and Greco-Bactrian coins. The next coin is of the very famous King Menander. And here again, you see him as wearing uh, a Greek helmet, uh, Athenian helmet. And quite interestingly, now here you see that on the two sides of coins, there are two inscriptions. By far, the first and the second coin that we saw had only Greek inscriptions. Whereas these coins, uh, from the time that the Indo, the Greek Bactrians appeared on the south of the Hindu Kush, as I said, they came in touch with uh, different cultural practices and different scripts and different languages. They co-opted the existing local scripts on their coins. So here on the reverse, you see the figure of Athena who is also thundering, much like the Zeus on the first coins, throwing a thunderbolt. But around her, uh, there is an inscription which is inscribed in the local Indian script, which was Karoshti, and in the lo local Indian language, which was Prakrut, but a version of Prakrut that was prevalent in Gandhara, which was called Gandhari. So here, the inscription on the obverse is in Greek, the depiction of the king on obverse, the bust of the king on obverse wearing a Greek helmet. And on the reverse, there is this uh, interesting feature of um, having incorporated the, the Karoshti and, and Gandhari uh, legends. The inscriptions on the obverse read Basilios Soteros, uh, the, the king, the savior. And below it says Minandru, which means off Minander. And equivalent Indian legends inscriptions on these coins, Maharajasa Tratarasa Menandrasa. So uh, of the king, of the, of the savior, of Menander. Uh, all these three words are in, in the sixth case, uh, the genitive sixth case or Shashti Vibhakti as it is called in Indian grammar. Quite uh, an important uh, and a significant uh, deviation from the traditional norms of Greek coinage was, in fact, the bilingualism and the bi-scripturalism that one sees on these uh, Indo-Greek coins. By, by far, the Indo-Greek coins are an examples of very excellent execution, excellent engraving techniques and very realistic portraiture. Many of these kings are almost uh, rendered as good as, as as if they were their photographs. And there's 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 a theory that these in, these in the 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 pictures, the busts were actually copied from marble busts uh, that existed in 3D. Uh, and then the, the artist actually looked at these marble busts and 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 then sort of rendered them on on the dies that that uh, that were used to strike the coins. Um, a very uh, interesting depiction that you see here is. Uh, of a Jugate bust, the, the king and queen depicted uh, across like uh, you know overlapping faces, uh, and this is a coin of uh, a late Indo-Greek king whose name is Hermios, and Hermaeus um, has the name of the queen also appears on the coin, and the name of the queen is Calliope. Uh, the inscription in in Greek reads Basilios Soteros Hermeou, and below it reads K Calliopes, so with Calliope. So this is a complete, this is def, uh, by, by surely this is a kind of a joint issue. And on the reverse, you see an equestrian portrait and there has been some sort of debate about what exactly this equestrian portrait represents. Most likely it represents um, uh, Alexander 
And uh, as we have seen in the design context, the reverse of these coins has always been reserved to show divinities. So here, obviously, Alexander uh, is shown as as not as a, a, a mortal king, but as a god. And he's he's riding his his horse with a with a quiver uh, attached, a bow and bow case uh, attached to uh, to his to its rump. The inscription here in Karoshti reads Maharajasa Kradarasa He Ramayasa and in at the bottom it reads Kali UPA. Uh, it is the Indian rendering of these names. This is again an, a linguistically a very interesting point that uh, many of these Greek names are rendered into their in Indian uh, versions as it, as it were. The Greek rule sort of came to an end in, in first century BC around uh, 70 or 80 AD uh, BC and uh, they were substituted by Indo-Scythians or Shakas and uh, the, the kind of syncretism that was going on uh, during uh, the Indo-Greek period carried on uh, the, the use of Greek and Karoshti and Gandhari uh, carried on in, in the Scythian period. And the next coin that we see is of, a, of a, an Indo-Scythian king called Mois um, who ruled be roughly between 80 and 60 BC. And I, I've chosen this because it, 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 it exemplifies the the kind of syncretism um, very, very well uh, between the Indian and the Greek iconographic traditions. Here you see on obverse, uh, there is a seated figure of Zeus who's seated on the throne carrying a scepter in his hand. And next to him is the depiction of a thunderbolt, which is obviously one of his main attributes, but the thunderbolt has been rendered in a human form. So this is a thunderbolt man that is standing next to him and Zeus is placing his hand on the shoulders of his, of his attribute. But this is again a very unique uh, syncretism because nowhere in Greek tradition one would find the personification of the, of the, of the divine attributes like this. But in Indian tradition, we have this, this particular uh, respect um, where attributes are often given um, human um, forms and they are called Ayudha Purushas. So the Purusha, the man that actually represents the Ayudha of the, the weapon of the person. And this is exactly what is being sort of seen here on, on, on this Scythian coin uh, that Zeus' main attribute, the, his main weapon, Thunderbolt, has been actually given a human form and he stands next to the deity that whose attribute it, it is. And uh, this is again a very significant uh, uh, iconographic uh, feature that one sees on these coins. Um, as I said, the, the use of Greek and Karoshti uh, carries on with these coins. Um, on the obverse of this coin, it's, it's uh, the king uh, name is written as Basileos Basileon, which, is, which means the king of kings. And this is again um, kind of refers to or reflects on the kind of kingship that was being produced, that was being practiced by the Scythians who are nomadic people. So they had various sub kings and 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 a supreme king ruling over these sub kings. So it was it was it was uh, they they practiced what was known as segmented kingship. And uh, the fact that the supreme ruler is called king of kings is a reflection of that because he is indeed the supreme king who's ruling over many other uh, smaller uh, kings. Um, on the reverse, the Karoshti inscription here reads Rajadi Rajasa Mahatasa, uh, the great king, the king of kings, the great uh, Mois uh, uh, Muasa in Gandhari Prakrit. When a very famous uh, example of uh, Gandharan syncretism is exem exemplified again by this uh, wonderful depiction of the Indic uh, deity Gajalakshmi uh, on these coins that were struck by the Indo-Scythian ruler Asilisis. You can see him riding a horse and this is, this is significant because horse riding was uh, very significant for a nomadic people like the Scythians and this is how they chose to depict their their rulers riding a horse also carrying a whip in his, in, in in his hand and these were the kind of uh, uh, the kind of royal imagery that uh, the greek the, the scythians uh, chose to show their on their coins basileos basileon megalu king of king the great the greatest asilisu uh, which appears uh, at the bottom is the name of asilisis the scythian ruler but on the reverse you find this wonderful representation indian representation of 
the goddess uh, Gaja Lakshmi or Abhisheka Lakshmi, which needs no introduction to any Indian audience because it is so uh, superfluous in its depictions right for the last 2000 uh, years. Here you see um, the goddess uh, standing on a lotus and she is anointing uh, by two elephants which are also standing on long stemmed uh, lotuses. By far one of the earliest renderings of uh, Indian gods and goddesses are found on Gandharan coins. Um, we saw the coin of Agathocles, the person who struck the commemorative coins for Alexander. He is also accredited with striking coins that show Sankarshana Balarama and Vasudeva Krishna, two uh, very early sort of proto Vaishnava representations of Indian gods in, um, in, in about 185 BC, possibly the earliest datable representations of Indian gods. And that sort of that 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 tradition is is carried on by uh, the Scythian and Parthian rulers. So here we see this uh, very um, beautiful uh, representation of Gaja Lakshmi or Abhisheka Lakshmi on the coin of Azalisis. The Scythians uh, were substituted in parts of Gandhara, not as a watertight compartment with certain amount of overlap by the Parthians. And the Parthians came from Iran uh, or Eastern Iran to be, to, be, to be specific. And one of the greatest kings in the Parthian lineage was Gondofaris. And uh, here is a coin of Gondofaris. They carry on with the Scythian style of uh, showing the king on the horseback. But just in front of the king, there is this kind of symbol that looks like a old fashioned television antenna. Uh, and that is called a tamga. That particular symbol uh, originates as from the practice of branding horses uh, in terms of ownership. So this, this, these kinds of symbols were actually stamped on the, on the rumps of horses to indicate uh, their ownership. And um, this then sort of then translated themselves into some sort of royal symbols. Um, the practice of having these interesting features like monograms that I mentioned about earlier on is carried on by uh, both the, the Indo-Scythians and Indo-Parthians and on the reverse of this coin you see that in the center there is the standing figure of Shiva who's carrying a trident and he has uh, you know uh, unlocked uh, sort of his hair uh, which sort of flow behind his head but um, on either side you have these strange symbols and one of them is a sort of conglomeration of Karoshti letters. One of them is a conglomeration of Greek letters. So these, this, this, this system of adding these little symbols of monograms sort of carries on. And as I said, that we really don't know exactly what they, what they signify. But by and large, it is believed that they, they have some connection with, uh, with the mint and the minting activity. The inscriptions on these coins of Gondofares call himself, call him, call him great king, king of kings, but also the religious king. The, the, the interesting uh, word that uh, they used is Dharmiya, uh, Dharmika, which, which refers to uh, the fact that he was also called himself a, the righteous king in, in any ways. Um, and uh, uh, his name appears at the below the feet of the Shiva emblem as Gudu Farasa in Karoshti script and Gandhari language. The Indo-Parthians uh, were uh, substituted by Kushans in their wake and this is by far one of the most uh, famous uh, attempts of coin design, uh, examples of coin design uh, under the great Kushan king Kanishka and he was the first king to actually place a personified representation of the Buddha on his coins. And this is one, one such example. Um, the Ashmolean has uh, probably the, the, the biggest uh, accumulation of Kanishka's coins showing Buddha in copper. Uh, they are known in gold as well, but those are extremely rare. But in copper, uh, uh, we probably have about 20 pieces. They come in three denominations, the full unit, uh, kind of a half unit and a quarter unit. This is a representation of the full unit. They show Buddha in two uh, distinct forms. One is seated and one is standing. The standing Buddha, as you see on this coin, is the historic Buddha and he is identified in the inscriptions on these coins as Shakyamuni Buddha. So he's, he's very much the historic Buddha. The seated Buddha that, you, that, that appears on Kanishka's coins is actually the future Buddha, the, the Buddha that is going to appear at the end of the world and he's Maitreya Buddha. So again, he is also uh, identified quite clearly by the inscriptions. 
the script and language that you see on these coins has now moved there is a, a script in in vogue here which is a kind of a derivative of the greek script but it includes certain phonemes certain sounds which the original greek does not have so for example it includes an a letter to denote the sound sh which is not existent in in greek language the inscriptions are inscribed in a kind of a hybrid greek language, uh, greek uh, greek script which is also called the bactrian greek script or the arian script the language in which, in which these inscriptions are written is is definitely uh, a form of Iranian that was practiced in Bactria so the kushans although they were uh, ruling very much in india they sort of kept uh, their central asian roots intact but culturally they also wanted to show that they were act they were actually iranians rather than uh, central asians so this is this is a kind of uh, cultural uh, sanskritization you might call it that one sees in all uh, people who who have sort of uh, unsettled uh, un non sedimentary nomadic backgrounds that they they actually look look up to settled cultures as and, and appropriate them so in in a similar way the kushans had appropriate uh, appropriated the iranian uh, cultural norms with the appropriation of cult in iranian cultural norms also came uh, the appropriation of uh, iranian religious practices and the major religion that was in vogue in iran at this time was zoroastrianism and here you have a uh, example of a gold coin of the kushan king huvishka which has this representation on the reverse of the kush the, the zoroastrian concept the, it's the concept of kingly glory or pharaoh, um, and here you see the concept in in a in a, in a personified way. It's a standing soldier, uh, or, or wearing a sort of Greek uh, uniform, Greek garb, also wearing uh, the headscarf or the diadem, which is a kind of indication of uh, of kingship. Carries a live fire in in his extended hand, and also has flaming shoulders. This is the kind of aura uh, that the king is supposed to uh, have um, harbored. And the magnificent depiction of the king that you see on obverse is also a divine representation of the king because the king is actually coming out of mountains. So he's, he's rising out of, of mountains, which is not a, a kind of human depiction. So the king in Kushan idea of kingship was definitely a divine person it was he was not amongst the lesser mortals um the inscription here reads in uh bactrian uh, language and kushan hybrid uh, greek script as shao nano shao ueshki koshano uh shao nano shao is king of kings shahananam sha the king of kings shana shayatia nam shayatia in uh, avestan uh, and it's been re rendered as shao nano shao um on the reverse as i said it is the representation of faro uh, and his name is written on the, on the right hand side. On the left hand side, just below the arm that carries the, the flames is the representation of the Tamgha, which is uh, the kingly uh, symbol of Havishka uh, that, is, that is shown on, on these coins. The Kushans were, uh, the Kushan Empire sort of fragmented uh, kind of under its own weight because it is so vast. And um, in the Gandharan, uh, in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent, a chunk of it was then subsequently ruled by a branch of the Sasanian uh, kings from Iran, and they, they called themselves Kushan Shahs, the kings of the Kushans. And uh, these, uh, in numismatic terms, the coinage that they issued is, coin as, is called as uh, Kushano Sasanian coins. And here is an example of a Kushano Sasanian coins. As you can see, it copies the Kushan depictions, the, the the main Kushan depictions that you see on coins, was a king that was engaged in sacrifice. So here is here is a king standing, and uh, he is performing. Uh, he's throwing in oblations from his hand into a, a, a fire altar, and he's carrying a divine attributes such as uh, a trident. But here, in this particular uh, case. The, the the depiction of this king and also on the reverse uh, is the depiction of what originally was a Shiva standing against reclining against Nandi um, but the garb the 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 kind of uh, visual language that uh, these this this king has is all Iranian so this is very interesting uh, from the transculturation point of view um, this is a coin issued by uh, Hormuz the first Kushan Shah 
uh, who ruled in uh, the, the late sort of late third century AD. And on the obvious, you see uh, him standing in, in wearing Iranian uh, clothes, but in a Kushan sort of style or fashion. Um, next to him uh, uh, on the right is also a tamgha, uh, a kind of a Kushan-like symbol that 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 is that is there. Um, the identity of these uh, these rulers is also established uh, by unique headgears that uh, these these wear. And here, uh, King Hormuzd is actually wearing a headgear that has uh, the frontispiece of a lion, a, a, a roaring lion, uh, right right above above its head. And on the reverse, there is uh, obviously uh, a kind of a rendering of Shiva, but the inscription identifying identifies him as the great god. Or Hurzavanda Yazda, uh, which is uh, in Zoroastrian terms the Great God, or Ahura Mazda. So um, this is uh, an interesting, uh, typically for Gandharan uh, region, this is an interesting sort of instance where visual depictions choose to speak different vocabularies. They, they speak different languages, uh, and uh, they they have this kind of very interesting admixture of of uh, of cultural. Uh, and uh, iconographic uh, norms, as it were. The last coin that I have chosen is uh, 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 not yet very well published. And it is a coin of the Huns, uh, which appeared uh, in sort of fourth, uh, mid fourth to late fourth uh, century onwards into uh, what is today uh, uh, the area near Kabul, and uh, then th this was one 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 more sort of uh, wave of uh, people coming into this region from uh, Central Asia. Um, what is interesting about this particular uh, coin is that this very unique kind of depiction that it has. It has a, a Han ruler uh, depicted covered by the three hooded cobra, which is which sort of you know uh, covers his head. Interestingly, the, the coin itself is struck not in the name of the king, but in the name of Dharma. This is a, a very interesting shift. The inscription is in Sanskrit and it reads Jayatu Dharma, which means Dharma is victorious. And this is a very challenging and interesting uh, shifting kind of pattern that one sees. Uh, uh, the word, the way the word Dharma is employed in, in, in this, what does the word exactly mean? Uh, does it mean the Buddhist Dharma? Does it mean the Hindu Dharma or Vaishnava or Bhagavad Dharma or Brahmanical Dharma, whatever. But it is interesting that the coin is actually stuck in the name of Dharma. The Huns have received a, quite a lot of bad publicity, thanks mainly to the Chinese uh, traveler Xuan Zhang, uh, who describes them as barbarous and, uh, and and a kind of an enemy of Buddhism. But um, archaeological and numismatic data from or evidence from from ground actually shows us that this was not probably the case. It was not as 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 un unilateral or one sided as Xuan Sang uh, mentions. Uh, there was there were lots of shades of grey, and this is an emerging area of Gandharan studies. I mean. Everybody talks about Gandhara uh, when the word Gandhara is mentioned. Everybody, everybody thinks Buddhism and Buddhist sites and Buddhist archaeology and Buddhist inscriptions and Buddhist religious scrolls. However, Gandhara uh, carries on in, in, in you know even after fifth uh, century when Buddhism is kind of on the decline and it's sort of the the emerging the uh, the incoming uh, new. Uh, nomads that, that come into the region bring with them their own uh, uh, kind of religious ideas which then mix with the existing uh, religious practices and, and cultural practices. So this sort of waves of cultural uh, mixture and advent carries on in Gandhara uh, forever. And this is what makes Gandharan numismatics uh, so fascinating because in a visual way, these little objects uh, kind of encapsulate these various processes and also offer us methodologies, techniques by which we can actually peg these developments on a chronological uh, spectrum.
so this was a, a pleasure to uh, take you through this journey of um, 600 years of Gandharan coins, coinage uh, through 10 Ashmolean objects. I'll be very happy uh, to take more questions or further inquiries through the Live History uh, website. So please keep your questions coming and uh, I would be, it would be, I would love to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you.